Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. And this is episode number 498. That's 498 of the Agassino Zynga show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, doing the best I can with the time I have available and all that malarkey. I hope you are well, wherever this may meet you. If it's your first time viewing the show or checking out the show, wherever you may see it, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below with all your thoughts, feelings, and suggestions. I'd love to hear from you. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, if you could spare five minutes and leave me a five-star review or whatever star review regarding your enjoyment of the show, that would be much appreciated too. That helps the show to creep up the algorithm, gives it a bit of exposure, you know, just lets people know that people are listening to it. You know, people are in it. a bit of group think a bit of missing me too. And hopefully I shall gain a bigger and wider audience. And of course, support for your patrons. Also welcome to at patreon.com for says Agostino. Patreon content for all my Patreon subscribers is coming at the end of this week. You get bonus content on there only for Patreon subscribers. It's equivalent of one pound or one dollar per month. You get access to all my bonus content. So don't delay. Jump on there today. That would very much appreciate it. And yeah, apart from that, we've got a jam pack show for you in it jam pack show as per usual Whew. Um, i've got an action pack weekend coming up obviously as i mentioned prior i'm gonna go to labyrinth at toft manor for the it's basically a an inner vision um weekend but i don't think they've actually built it as that let me actually see what it's actually called um dixon um labyrinth Maybe it's not called Inner Visions. Um, it's open air. It's elaborate. It's, it's open air with uh, Arm and Dixon playing back to back with some other people as well playing. So that should be happening this weekend. So it's going to be a really jam packed weekend for me in terms of partying and getting happy and jumping up and down. Um, I'll put the thing up here on the screen so you can see where I'll be heading to. Duh, 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 duh. Come on, come on, come on. Load, 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 load. Bish, bash, bosh there we go it's loading so it looks like the, the the festival or the open air itself has officially sold out the tickets they have available now the ones that are on um well, the ones that people resell i guess through the yara platform which is fairly easy to do so if you ever kind of change your mind at a rave you don't want to go to and you want to shift your tickets in a safe and manageable way especially for the buyer i think for the seller you don't really care how you sell it you just want to get some you just want to extract you just want to extract as much value as you can out of it in terms of monetarily but for the buyer you have to be really aware because just the other week I was attempting to go to Pussy Palace at Flipping Color Factory and the amount of scammers I interacted with in the comments and just in DMs was insane. Um, clearly scammers, right? Which they didn't have the ticket. They weren't willing to send you proof of it. Like all this little dumb stuff. I was like, bruv, you're trying to scam people out of 10 quid. Like it's not even a sophisticated scam because as soon as you scam me, I'll let everybody else and that's it. You're done. You just, you know, it's a scam that you've only kind of gained 10 pound off the back of. And it's a very niche scam too, right? These guys are kind of, or whoever they are, guys guys or girls are basically targeting people who want to go to dance or want to go to raves basically late at night or parties and whatnot under the guise that maybe they might be inebriated or drunk inebriated or high so that they won't be focusing on who they're buying the ticket from or just send the funds without actually seeing proof of the actual ticket which is obscene i don't show how anybody nowadays with the proliferation of information out there and all these youtube accounts there's, there's youtubers out there who exist to basically expose all those kind of scam call center people or the ones that say you have a virus on your computer you have to be a real dunce to allow yourself to get scammed you know from tickets online really it's not that hard to kind of ascertain when somebody's kind of run running you for four so that the ra reselling thing is pretty neat idea but anyway returning to my weekend coming up labyrinth open air arm back to back playing with dixon and a whole host of other innovation folk you got arm back to back at dixon you got alex medina you got dj holographic detroit legend i'm really looking forward to seeing her play live jennifer cardini again associated loosely with um innovations but mostly a running back artist jimmy jules of course the Innovision, Lola Harrow, Nick Castle, who I'm sure is associated with Labyrinth, um, Sophia Cortesis, Tur, Trix, and Tisha, right? So it's going to be an absolute banging event. It's going to be in this amazing 
grounds, Tofts Manor, right, just outside of London. Um, again, you know, just a great location, very picturesque, a place to kind of detach and kind of disconnect from the hustle and bustle of London, which there's no real hustle and bustle because, you know, we're living in a post-pandemic or we're living in a post-lockdown world and London isn't as busy or as rampacked as it once was prior. So it's not like you're escaping from anything. You just go in there because you want to go there. So looking forward to that. Um, that should be action-packed, jam-packed. Like I said, I'm going to recording. So I'm going to be recording some special content only for the Patreon subscribers so if you want to get an idea on what the experience is like to go to this labyrinth open air and you want to get some exclusive pictures and videos that only be available to my patron subscribers make sure you subscribe at patreon.com for just agostino that content will be coming at the end of this week as soon as i come back i'm going to upload all that stuff edit it and do whatever needs to be done to get it out there because i think i'll have some really good stories to tell and um, per our weekend excursion and then what else I was thinking? Oh, yeah, I was thinking about this, actually, today, earlier. I think touching upon that nonsense story I mentioned in the other podcast about me kind of crossing paths with somebody that I hadn't seen in, like, five years and that person kind of purposely, you know, turning their head away, trying to avoid eye contact so that I wouldn't say nothing to them. But I didn't notice them at first. I only kind of noticed them quite close as we, as we were about to get closer to each other. I was like, oh, they're clearly trying to, like, turn the other way so they don't have to see their face and stuff. It's like bizarre i've not spoken to you in five years it's unlikely i'm gonna go and say anything at the time and it kind of pissed me off and it offended me it got it got um, it got under my skin it annoyed me then it made me realize that in general my kind of personality um i kind of thrive off that like i need to have a chip on my shoulder i need to feel like people have kind of wronged me or counted me out or taken me for granted or thought i couldn't do x y and z so i can fight against it and i have these weird kind of internal arguments that i have with myself with people who I haven't spoken or seen to seen in years who probably are not thinking about me one iota but in my head i'm thinking about how i can prove them wrong with the things that i'm doing in life and it's just really really r-worded it's extremely r-worded but in an effort to kind of better understand myself during this post lockdown world i've kind of slowly but surely started to accept some of the things some of my character traits that i think can be harmful or destructive but i've also learned not to maybe pour gasoline on them right or to just not get myself overly gassed up and start kind of believing in my own narrative but the plain reality of the fact is even though i don't remember because the thing is interesting i don't usually remember the slights so for instance this passing of somebody in the street i won't remember it maybe in a, in a few months right but I will still remember the feeling of how I felt. So when I see that person's face, it won't be like a nice feeling. You know, when you see somebody you haven't seen in a while, you're like, oh my God, wow, nice to see you. I won't remember exactly what you did wrong to me, but I'll remember that the feeling that you gave me at the time wasn't great. So I'm just going to keep my face deadpan. If you try to engage, I'm just going to be on smoke straight away. Do you know what I mean? I'm just going to go straight to level 10 and like go straight for the takedown. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's kind of what, what time I'm on. And again, it's not good. I don't think it's really great for your meant for your sight for yeah for your physical or mental well-being at all um to be holding on to things like that but i don't know it's just always been a part of me it's always been something that drove me like the whole reason why i went to flipping central st martin's in the first place one of the our more premier art schools here in the uk you know worldwide renowned for their fashion program and stuff i did product design over there the main reason why i decided to go there was because the art teacher i had in sixth form basically yeah, the attitude I had in sixth form didn't like me for, you know, good reasons because I didn't basically do the work, but I was kind of obviously quite clearly talented at painting and whatever it may be. And it came really easy to me, but I took the piss in the class and really didn't take it serious. So I definitely understand why she wasn't really fond of Agostino, the student. But then she went the extra step and there was another girl in our class who was, you know, talented as well, but more of a hard worker. And she was angling herself to go to St. Martins in an effort to kind of, you know, because she had a whole plan of how she was going to spec out her career. And she knew what she was doing. I'm going to St. Martins for three years. I'm going to do this, do that. And then now she's working into an amazing place. I forgot where it was because I bumped into her a few years ago, but she's doing really well for herself. But the teacher basically used that girl as an example to kind of like remind it. Not like, yeah, but you, you know, like when you're younger and your parents would like say, oh, 
your parents would talk about how great the other family's kids were and you would be deep down thinking mm, you don't really know what this kid gets up to you know what I mean for real but they'd be using other people's kids as an example to kind of embarrass you and that's what that teacher was doing she was basically using this girl as an example of oh my god I can't believe it you're getting in you don't even have to do a foundation all this stuff for Central Minds blah blah blah, blah, blah. congratulations she made it a big deal and then whenever she spoke to me and a few other people who she didn't like in the class it was a bit like you know her, her, her energy levels dropped she didn't really give a shit so I thought you know what you're kind of like taking you're basically assuming none of us none of us can get into that place too that you're lording and you're putting all the kind of love and attention on this girl rightly so forever it may be but i'm not having it so what i decided to do was just apply to go to central martin's just to spite her and to kind of prove her wrong which i did and it turned up to be a horrible experience going there to be honest especially living at home and whatnot not the best decision i ever made but I generally decided to go to their minds and again, seeing the look on her face when I got in, again, without having to do a foundation, it kind of just, it made my day, you know what I mean? And again, I didn't think about it again after that. It's just something that just kind of moved on, but I needed that kind of pushback and that friction to drive me to do something like that. In theory, again, in, you know, when you kind of zoom out, it didn't work out really in general, but still, um, I've learned to kind of slowly but surely accept that weird part of my personality that needs some sort of enemy, some sort of detractor, some sort of naysayer to come against me so that I can then push back against them or just people that kind of think they're too important, you know, that kind of stuff, all those people that think they're too important, um, they've got an ego, which I understand as well, I get it, if you've got an ego, if you've got an ego because you're essentially being able to, you know, curb, you know, um, skip through life without having to really work hard at anything everything's kind of been handed to you um and you've kind of just figured it out because there's a there's a grift to it too right there's a grift where you're like your parents are you know well off and they're supporting you which has no problem with either but there's also a real talent in the ability of just being able to figure out a solution for yourself a gig that doesn't really make any sense it's not really there's no kpis against what you do it's just kind of ephemeral and you just kind of exist you get paid to exist so you you kind of like um it kind of uh, relates back to that quintessential Aaron Bondorov quote, right? The legend, um, the you know founder of a New York thing and whatever else, and Oh Wow Gallery, where he said in that iconic video with Aaron Preston, like, you know, it's all about turning your lifestyle into a job, isn't it? Right? And that's what some of these people have been able to do. And I understand the arrogance and the kind of like snobbiness that comes with it when you figure that stuff out because it is like a magic trick, right? You go from one moment working in a shoe shop, suddenly you're standing next to one of the biggest pop stars in the world and you no one knows what you do. You know what I mean, you're just hanging around, right? Um, so that's a that's a flex. I understand it. But there's also needs to be a recognition that, you know, chances are chances and the ones that are kind of got god-given talents and gifts and just need to figure out in terms of how to make it you know pr you know viable in terms of career they're the special ones you know what i mean it's all well and good you being the person that you've been able to grift and you've been able to figure it out that way but when the real talented dons come in and step in and they match it with hard work and they match it with perseverance and they match it with networking you're, you're out of here but you just need to kind of match them on that same thing which is why i don't really like the whole discourse around people when they complain and say oh he or she knows that person that's where she they got there it's like yeah that's that's what you should be doing if you've got networks and but you don't really have the skill to get you in that position you should be using your network and your contacts to get there that's the whole point of having networks and contacts that's the whole point of licking people's ass like licking people's ass does work it does it grows for some people but everyone's got their role to play in life everyone's got their approach everyone's got their personality um everyone's got their temperament if that comes natural to you and it's okay then do it and make it work but again don't be complaining about them from the outside you need to match you need to basically if you've got the skills and experience you need to match that level of kiss yassi you know and just obviously include your experience and your talent and then usually more often than not that would get you where you need to get to still do you know what i mean there's no denying talent there's no denying straight up ability there's no denying proficiency there's no denying efficiency um you know all those things are definitely going to play a part when it comes to you getting where you need to get to but yeah i just figured out i was thinking ruminating thinking rah man i hold grudges weirdly but then i don't really remember what the grudge is about but then i'll always remember the feeling of how it made me feel and i'll never forget it so that when i do cross paths with you it's always going to be on 10. it's never going to be like oh yeah it's not it's never going to be it's always going to be go 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 time which again can be a bit r-worded but you know 
I am who I am. You know, you have to you have to just embrace who you are at this point in time. My personality is very unlikely to change. So, you know, let's make the best of it. <laughs> um, then I stumbled upon this really funny little clip or new story courtesy of UK Gossip TV where Shamaya Begum begs for forgiveness and claims that she didn't know Isis was a death cult before she joined. So this young lady has a very tragic story, kind of, if you think about it. Well, tragic, I guess it is tragic still. She essentially got recruited by Isis when she was like 15 or something like that. Um, flew over there with some of her friends. This was again during the heyday of Isis when they were filming those, you know, sensational videos, you know, crazy Hollywood production levels with drones and shit of people getting, uh, you know, executed in the middle of some desert sand dune somewhere right insane um she joined um allegedly the story goes that she tried to re rescue some of her friends uh, british intelligence don't believe that they basically say she played an integral role in recruiting other women into isis she was somebody that believed a lot in their values and whatnot and then i guess somewhere along the line she married one of the guys there had the kids all all of them died i think with the exception of maybe one did one die i'm not too sure no i'm definitely either all of them died or two died one or the other something tragic like that happened and maybe that was the reason why she suddenly had an awakening and she decided that she didn't want to be in isis anymore she went to come back to the uk but of course she'd been in isis territory for what a good amount of years it was very unlikely that she was going to be um how do you say it was very unlikely that she was going to be um reassimilated back into the west right especially um without any safety protocol it just wasn't going to happen so they didn't they didn't do that they blocked it they took away her citizenship and she's basically been stuck in a refugee camp ever since right she's basically got nowhere nowhere to call home for lack of a better term but ever since that she's been on tv crying and complaining about trying to get back into uk and the funny thing about it is that it kind of reminds me a little bit of um those occasions when you're in a club and you're acting out and a bouncer chucks you out really elegantly right because it's happened to me a couple of times where you're kind of acting out being a bit of a fool maybe someone's complained that you're stepping on their toes and you're being a little bit too you know um too loose with your hips and your and your wrist with your drink and you're spilling on people's shoes and shit he rolls up to you and he's like hey bruv let me talk to you a second you go what where, where, where come on come, come, come talk to you, talk to you. As he's, as he's kind of beckoning you, he's walking through the crowd. He walks outside where the smoking area is. He's like, come, come, come. You go down the corridor where the toilets are. Come, come, come. And then suddenly you're at the reception. Suddenly you're outside, right? That's like the quintessential tactic of security guards, right? They kind of get you outside in a very calm and easy manner without having to drag you by your heels or anything. And then by the time you realize that you're outside and your coat's in your hand and you're going home by yourself, do you know what I mean? That can happen quite quickly. But usually in that occasion, there are occasions where I've happened to be in that occasion. I've happened to be in that position where you start, you know, pleading your case with the bouncers. And from what I've known, from especially from guys that I know that do um, that that are bouncers in clubs or people that do security, if you've ever ch have to chuck somebody out and put them on the other side of the gate, on, of the gate there's no coming back. If you've had to go to that point, usually you've assessed everything and you've come to a conclusion that this person can't operate in the space that you're trying to secure, whatever it may be. So there's usually no going back. And of unless of course you're a very, you know, attractive young female um who's been who's able to swoon those guys over but even then i don't think they would be willing to do it because it's just too much hassle because you know god forbid later down the line that really buxom full-lipped woman that they decide to let back in decides to kick off at someone at the bar those security guards will be in trouble so you just can't do it so for me it just feels like she's wasting her breath she's standing outside the club begging to get back in she's telling the bouncers about her mates who where they're sitting she wants her jacket and she gets her jacket she still doesn't leave like it's just not enough the party's over with like do you know what i mean you went and enjoyed isis it didn't work out you got cold feet you realize that they were dev cult too late and you know the uk doesn't want you anymore it makes complete sense but let's hear a little bit of a clip this is taken from um good morning britain let's hear a little bit what she has to say i don't think so because the reason i came to isis to syria was not for any violent reasons not because i wanted to be a terrorist it was because i thought i was doing the right thing as a muslim and I was, I, I did not want to hurt anyone, you know, in Syria or anywhere else in the world. So, yeah, but it's hard to justify that, isn't it? Imagine telling people that you didn't know what ISIS was when you were 15. That was what, 2015, maybe even, maybe 2013, when she was that age. Like, come on, we don't believe that. And if we, if you want to know why I'm not sympathetic about her case, let's just read over her Wikipedia quite quickly, right? It says Shemaya Begum 
born 25th of August 1999, is a denaturalized British woman who left the UK aged 15 to join the Islamic State. Her attempt to return to UK in 2019 resulted in litigation culminating in the decision of the Supreme Court and the public debate about the handling of the returning extremists. In February 2019, the Home Secretary Acting Government of the United Kingdom revoked her British citizenship and he later stated that she would never be allowed to return. So at the highest levels of a court, they're like, nah, she's not coming back background. Begum was born in England to immigrant parents of Baghdadi origin and citizenship. She was raised as a Muslim in Bethnal Green area of Tower Hamlets, quite near me, where she received her secondary education at Bethnal Green Academy together with her friends. Shortly after her departure, so da, 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 um, she left the UK in February 2015, age 15. So 2015, she says, she had no idea what ISIS was about. And if you were on the internet and you were on some of the dark alleys of the web you would have seen the videos of isis you would have known um about how ruthless they were right and how much fear they struck in people right and the the violent lengths that they went to basically reaffirm their message to say that a 15 year old didn't have and again we were passing around those videos on our phones so you know i can only imagine what these kids were doing back in the day so to say that you didn't know what isis was about is a complete lie like that's why you know come on this is true so she she, tra- she left the uk in February 2015, age 15, they traveled via Turkey to join the Daesh in Syria, in Syria, sorry. Um, shortly after her departure, Begum's sister expressed hope that she and her school friends had traveled to ISIL territory only to bring back their friend. Education Secretary Nikki Gorman, Nikki Morgan said in February 2015 that everyone hoped that and prayed for the safe return of the three girls because at the, at the time they were under the guise that they were trying to rescue their friend. Nonsense. Ten days after arriving in Syria, Begum married Dutch man born uh, Jago Rajik um, in a, a convert of Islam who had arrived in Syria in October 2015. Um, the marriage may not be recognized under Dutch law since she was underage at the time. <laughs> she gave birth to three children, all of whom died young. Her youngest child was born in refugee camp in February 2019. And by March 2019, he had died of lung infection. So absolute horror show of situations was the end. Of course, had sympathy for her for it. But then it reports here, the Daily Telegraph reported that Begum was an enforcer of the ISIL morality police and tried to recruit other young women to join a jihadist group. She was allowed to carry a Kalashnikov rifle and earned the reputation as a strict enforcer of ISIL's laws, such as the dress codes for women. An anti-ISIL activist told her and told the Independent that there were separate allegations of Begum um, stitching suicide bombers into explosive vests so that they could not be removed without detonating. That is nuts. So this girl here who's trying to play the victim and act all sweet and innocent with a little hat on. Again, she doesn't really have a good PR team, probably, because, you know, she's in a refugee camp. She probably doesn't have any sort of team. But someone needs to tell her to kind of take off the hat and just, I don't know, get some curls, maybe, you know, brighten up the eyes a little bit and get a little bit more sad because she obviously doesn't look like somebody that you would assume um, is trying to beg to get back into the country. She still looks like a little bit of a hoodlum. (laughs) No, I'm joking. But in general, just, I don't know, man. She just needs to give it up. I, I know it's sad. I know it's out of order. Your citizenship is gone. I don't know what happens to her in the future, where she goes from here. But the fact remains, you know what I mean? You went to fucking Syria when you were 15, in 2015. Like, to say that you don't know what ISIS was about back then is just beyond, beyond a lie, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's above a lie. I don't know what that even is, above a lie, but it's, it's above. Talking about lies, why are they lying to us that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are one of the hundred, well, one of the... 100 most influential people in the world why are they doing this to us and why is prince harry standing behind megan like this what is this picture i don't understand it this has to be up there with one of the most cucked images i've ever seen in my entire life and it's so unnecessary like what he did for his wife and his family was incredibly brave it took a lot of courage it took a lot of balls to decide to basically excommunicate yourself from the royal family to basically denounce your throne denounce your title all that sort of shit right that's big deal right um having to go on your own and make money your own way and startups and be an investor and all this sort of stuff a media personality from somebody that again you grow up in a family where you basically are told um that there's nothing more important than keeping secrets there's nothing more important than presenting a good face to the public and all this sort of stuff to go from that to being a kind of open book sort of weird youtube 
influencer person guy whatever is a very strange pivot but the fact that he did it is commendable enough do you know what i mean he doesn't need to go on this sort of like weird cucky soy boy tour where he's keep standing behind his missus to basically illustrate what that she's the one wearing the trousers no she isn't because she clearly said in the interview that she went to off herself because the queen and a few other people in the family were mean to her again you know looking back at that interview with oprah like you know let's relax oh were we surprised that the royal family had some very um derogatory and insulting views against a mixed race lady that is marrying the prince like are we surprised that they might have some questionable views on race <laughs> and on class when it comes to um prince harry marrying basically an ex you know um hollywood actor are we surprised by it not really but that was enough to send her into a spiral. So the fact that they've got her in a pair of trousers standing in front of Prince Harry, who is like leaning on the on the wall, he's wearing black, she's wearing white. Is she the real hope? And he's in the back in clandestine, just protecting her. Or is it just one of those weird images where, you know, you hear a noise downstairs, uh, your missus looks at you, you look at her and you give it a bat and you kind of hide under the flipping duvet covers. What is this? Like who wants this really in general? Again, I think the Prince Harry who who kind of took his wife by the hand and said, we're leaving this family is the one that I would imagine most women would want, right? Did, would, they, would they want this one? This one that's kind of cowering behind a woman, hoping that she kind of, you know, saves him and protects him from all the nasty things that people are saying about him in public. Like, I don't know, man, this is really odd. And again, for, for people who said they wanted their own privacy, and they, again, this is a real Piers Morgan type of thing to say, but there might be some relevance in it, right? In the fact that they were very keen to escape the royal family in order for them to live a somewhat peaceful, private life. But if anything, everywhere you turn, these motherfuckers can't stop shutting up, right? They can't stop talking about their experience. They can't stop t posing for pictures, you know, doing press junkets or charity runs, whatever, whatever they're doing, whether it's authentic or not, there is... There is definitely some incongruence with the fact that you're asking for privacy, but then the moment you get it, you the moment you kind of get away from the monsters or people that are not giving you your privacy, all we keep seeing is you. Where where does the moment of self reflection of kind of going away and kind of collecting your thoughts and deciding what you want to do and how you are present yourself to the world? It doesn't exist. It's just fame, 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 fame. Put me in front of the cover. All this sort of stuff. Like, why are they influential? Why? Tell me. Tell me what's influential about them. I just don't understand it. I don't get it. Again, I think the Time Magazine, 100 of most influential people is similar to like those hip hop lists that they make of like dead, of a, dead or alive rappers and everyone gets in their flipping, their panties in a twist because everyone's got their favorites, but they do them because they know it generates clicks and it's an easy um, sort of piece of content that you can put out there that will go viral on its own. So maybe it's the same sort of thing with Time. You're not really meant to get annoyed about this sort of stuff. They're obviously doing it on purpose to press your buttons. Congratulations. You guys have won. You got me on that one. But I just don't see the, I just don't see how this is cool in any way or empowering. It does nothing to anybody. Like, what does this show? Like, I don't know. We all saw her again. We all saw her crying, complaining that she was nearly went to off herself because the queen was being mean. Why is she suddenly now wearing the trousers and wearing white and standing white? Why are we meant to believe that she's the strong matriarch that's holding down the family? We know that's not the case. We know that Prince Harry is the one that held them down. And again, as you should do, because he's a man, you should kind of step in when the woman kind of feels like she's on her last breath and she's crumbling and she can't handle it anymore, especially when she's pregnant. Of course, take the onus, protect your wife, protect your family. But this rewriting of the narrative is just utterly bizarre. I just don't understand it. Really, really don't. But, you know, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. Moving on, what else do we have here? Um, but, 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 but we don't talk about that we don't talk about this let's talk about this here yeah. let's see this um this is um because i saw this quote courtesy of mix mag via an anna christiansen um anna christensen christensen not christiansen christensen um interview via mix mag who i kind of saw briefly at fabric i'm pretty sure because i remember because i think her hair was dark before and now it's blonde so i'm pretty sure that was her behind the decks slaying after jeff mills played i'm pretty sure that was 
But anyway, this quote here kind of piqued my interest, right? It says here, DJs being more genre fluid motivates producers to be more fearless. And I've been seeing this kind of um, conversation happening a lot on social, especially on Twitter. It feels like on Twitter, there's an entirely different conversation around um, dance music and DJs that then you get on like Instagram. It's a completely different sort of uh, battle over there. And there are these weird asinine battles, some of them legit, some of them not so legit, some of them boring, some of them not so boring. But one of the more interesting ones is hearing people talk about how hard it is to basically be a uh, non, what's that thing called? Be like a like it's like, like this firm phrase says a genre fluid DJ, right? A DJ that doesn't necessarily prescribe to one genre. Like when people have always ask me, "Oh, what do you play?" I say, "I just play music," in it. Like maybe because I've grown up in England and we don't really have that thing of like being a specialist. They they do exist, of course, but in general people just want to mix whatever right they want to play whatever that's kind of how our pies always get down of course there are more specific raves that you could go to but people have the ability to you know in a techno set put on a house track that makes sense put on a drum and bass track that makes sense a jungle track that makes sense all these things can basically add to the overall tapestry of the sounds that you're trying to create when you're putting the mix together to just be kind of rigid in your sort of sound that you're playing and only play that sound just seems a little bit dull to me especially when people are paying good money to come and see you play and have a little bit of a boogie if they just wanted to hear you play the greatest hard dance mix or the, the greatest hard dance songs out now at the current moment they're just going to spotify and just hit shuffle but it's a bit more interesting if you can mix in some great pop tracks into that mix in some hip-hop into it like all that stuff is going to add i think to the overall experience but i guess for djs and artists when you get to a certain level you have to kind of you're basically put in a position where you're forced to specialize you're forced to basically say this is the genre i play this is what i'm going to put my hat on um because that's the only way you're going to again get bigger and bigger bookings because your agent that's how they end up getting paid right so the larger the booking they can get for you the more percentage or the more you know they can take out based on that percentage so maybe that's the reason why or maybe it's just like a uk thing we've just spoiled here where most people who are proficient at djing can play a decent set of most genres of music right maybe not a full hour set but maybe like a half an hour set i think most people have the ability to do that in the uk because we've just grown up listening to loads of shit watching loads of stuff radio all that sort of stuff it kind of helps us to do whatever it may be do so let's see if i can find this quote itself it says genre fluid mm, genre duh, duh, duh. But, 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 yeah there we go um yeah the, 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 um, it says breakbeat has come back into fashion again very true um so that she and uh, and anastasia christensen says the following i find lots of new generation djs are way more genre fluid which is good i've been that from the very beginning there's definitely more focus on shifting beats and rhythm sounds that are not so predictable i think that allows artists to be fearless in what kind of music they release so it gives more confidence to the creativity we have today because i feel like there's always pressure to make the next dance banger but because djs are also becoming more liberal with their choices it motivates producers to go more weird quirky and unconventional good point even though there's nothing unconventional about drum and bass as such the fact that the techno scene and the house scene are rushing more to those elements is exciting of course and i in general i, I don't know maybe again i'm spoiled but i remember when i was kind of growing up and getting into dance music kind of again one of my major kind of inspirations you know um francois kovokian um of course dj harvey dj hell early sven var but all these people were very kind of eclectic in their taste in music in the stuff that they played right they'd go from playing michael jackson to like an obscure trance track in a song like in a mix like they'd play legitimately any anything that would basically fit and then to go further on you hear people like ricardo Vera lobos another good example of it who you know had a very specific way of playing minimal that was unlike anybody else and it didn't just sound like minimal that everyone else was playing because it mixed loads of different stuff like tribal all these kind of things that is very kind of clever way of kind of doing it and then of course growing up in london in general like i said um you have the privilege of going to parties where there is no set genre that they're playing because once you get there or even if they do say there's a such set genre the do you just go completely crazy once they get behind the decks and start playing whatever because they go off the energy of the crowd whether it's bashment reggae pop stuff r&b whatever they'll just play it because they know what's going to get the crowd kind of crunk and get excited then you go to places like berlin and stuff which i love but one of the major criticisms i have about it it is quite one note and it is quite segregated 
there are places that you can go to which are mostly in like the what's the kind of touristy area like uh is it prince lauerberg or that sort of area right you can go to those kind of areas and you can find clubs that will just play you know reggaeton or hip-hop or whatnot it may be a mate or wherever it is but they're nowhere near anywhere located next to the techno kind of underground clubs that exist and those people don't cross paths at all or if for lack of a better term they probably hate each other right because those people are maybe the kind of people the techno people would assume would be the ones that live in buying or something whatever it may be right so there's that kind of divide that exists so there is no kind of blending of scenes and you really have to decide you have to be quite intentional about where you want to go fitting in the music whereas in london you could pop into any place major club and hear you know many genres played out throughout the entire night even if it's a if, even if it's a club night that's been specifically curated in a certain way you'd hear there are loads of different sounds on a continued basis which in general if you had then got the bug to start djing it would influence how you play and how you listen to music it wouldn't just be through just one year of like okay let me just keep this genre this bpm going again and again and again because it just feels boring to me after a while like all that hard techno stuff that everyone's playing now at the moment all the stuff you hear people playing at stuff like places like possession it's just all samey right it's all it's all the same it's all really reductive it's all sounds really i won't say uninspired but it just sounds a little bit boring um, you'd want to build up a mix now i don't believe in the mix where you go crazy and you sort of play a set where it only appeals to you know the boys that are listening to you or it's kind of like a how do you call it um you don't play like a youth club set right a set where you're only kind of playing to your friends and not the whole entire room that of course i'm not really a big fan of but it does need to be more of an acceptance or more of a willingness or more of an encouragement from whoever it is whether it's the bookers whether it's the managers um the, the promoters to be like hey let's try and push these djs to play more open sets to play more genre fluid sets or whatever it may be called maybe it, in, it requires you to let them play longer because it's difficult to be genre fluid if you're only playing for an hour right you get there and you've only got 50 minutes left because you got caught in traffic then by the time you start you've already on 48 minutes it's very difficult to kind of like play different sounds and go from different genres you just want to kick the bangers and make sure people dance so you get booked another time so i completely understand the pressures behind it but um interesting observation there from anastasia again maybe because she's european as well and she basically again she's not from berlin so maybe that can help but i think it's uh I think being general fluid is definitely one of the key things that you can learn in terms of kind of separating you or getting you kind of from being quite average to being okay really quickly. The idea that you can kind of blend genres and make it sound somewhat um, palatable, right? Um, it's definitely a way to go. Is definitely the way to go. Um, what else do we have here that I want to speak to you about specifically? Um, yeah, let's touch a bit on this. This touch a tiny, teeny bit on AOC's dress, isn't it? Um, Alessandria Ocasio Cortez, her dress at the Met Gala, specifically, right? Let's touch on that. So, obviously, most of you have seen the dress itself. It says "Tax the Rich," "Tax the Rich." It's very um, tone deaf. It doesn't really make much sense. It's a try and often repeated um, line by people on the left, especially in America. It doesn't actually do anything. It's pretty performative, and in general, it's just a little bit. Mm, do you know what I mean in terms of um actually influencing things and changing things for the better it just does absolutely nothing if anything like I said prior to the other podcast the best thing it actually fits like a glove and makes her bum look amazing so congrats on that but in general the interesting part about it is that as time goes on people end up revealing themselves and I think what we've seen with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez AOC she slowly but surely revealed herself to be just as bad as the people that she decries whenever she's doing those impassioned speeches and shit she's just as bad because there are many things that she could have enacted many things that she could have helped to spearhead that would have actually changed people's lives for the better and if anything um this sort of like performance whatever it is where you go to the met gala and where a dresser says tack the rich even though every ticket of yeah the tickets of entry to go to those kind of things are flipping you know thirty five thousand dollars or something nonsense like that you still have to be invited even to get so you don't it's not even like you can it's not even just because you have the money you can go you have to still get invited in order for you to you know get a ticket to go which is kind of similar to like you know sneakers app which i mean so exactly like when you enter the raffle you get the shoes for free you still have to enter the raffle and hope you get selected and then if you get selected you have the privilege of being able to spend your money at that store to get those shoes absolutely bizarre same with this so 
again, I think she thought she was doing something super subversive, as you can see of her tweet, the medium is a message. Um, but I think arriving to the uh, Met Gala in distress with people who l largely, for the most part, like you, welcome your politics, especially to your face, maybe behind your back, they're completely different. But for the most part, people that like you doesn't necessarily scream political message, doesn't necessarily scream protest, doesn't really scream shaking things up. Um, you got invited. It's hard to not get dis. It's hard to get disinvited for wearing something so asinine and run of the mill and lukewarm as tax the rich on your dress. Do you know what I mean, it doesn't really say much. Um, and then she kind of tried to explain away why she did this and the rationale behind it. The medium is a message. She's basically taking herself to be some sort of quasi political performance artist. I don't know, but regardless, it's absolutely R worded. The caption of it itself, the Instagram picture says, um, "Power to work with." of Robert James, a sustainably focused black woman immigrant designer. Like imagine collecting your friends like that. Cause I know some people do do that. I remember when I was growing up and I was kind of getting to see the first time, that was something that I had to kind of reconcile with in my head. The idea that I was being tokenized by the girls that I was bumping into because they hadn't necessarily met a kind of cool black guy like me. But then over time, you know, you kind of get over it. But some people do generally tend to have groups of friends like this where all their friends look like a United Colors of Benetton advertisement and it's quite purposely done and it's really disgusting. You see it often, especially in the scene. It's just a thing that people tend to do. It's really odd. Um, but hey, you continue. But imagine describing your friend like this in plain words, sustainably, right, focused, right? That's the reason why you chose her. So not because she actually makes good work, but because her kind of um, point of view, oh, what point of view what would you say? The way that she approaches design matches your political messaging or whatever it may be. She's a black woman immigrant. So again, choosing somebody based on their gender, which is basically what they're fighting against. But hey, we continue. He went from starting a dream uh, flea market to Brooklyn to winning the CFDA against all odds and then work together to kick open the doors of the Met. This time is now for child care. The time is now for child care, health care and climate so things tax and rich. What is that dress going to do to change those things? Wouldn't a bigger protest would have been to reject the invitation? Again, make a spectacle out of it. Maybe instead of rejecting the invitation, you rock up there with some disadvantaged kids and give them the opportunity to basically speak their piece on the red carpet. I don't know, it's a bit naff, it's a bit corny, but maybe all those things would have been would have been um a far better options in terms of actually serving the people that she thinks she's serving than wearing that dress and thinking that she was actually doing something it's utterly one of the most bizarre things i've seen um and then we have this massive text wall of information that she provided when somebody asked her on an ama after the fact because i guess the kickback and harassment online was getting too much so she had to explain herself and make it make sense the person on Instagram stories asked the following, said, love your dress, but what do you want to say to critics after attending the Met Gala? She says, I thought about the criticism I'd get. So she thought about it prior to doing it, as most people who want to get attention online, everything is intentional. Nothing is by chance. You do everything with the understanding and the acceptance and the willing and the hope that people are going to go crazy and get angry over the things you do. You just hope it doesn't go too far, right? No physical, no physical violence or anything, nonsense like that. But as long as I say mean words to you, the algorithm doesn't care if it's mean or if they're good words. The fact that people are talking about you is a good thing. And it's definitely going to help her kind of leverage that kind of attention into other deals that she ends up getting down further down the line. So she's very clever in that regard. Um, she's just clever in general. Do you know what I mean? It's just a shame that she's so um, incongruent. But we continue. Since the moment I won the election, that's kind of been the expected and normalized to me. Um, the irony is that, oh, okay, please, okay. The irony is that when women in power take the pro the prospect of criticism to be um, cautious in their actions, they are then criticized for being inauthentic or too calculated. Ultimately, the haters hated, and the people who are thoughtful were thoughtful. But we were, but we all had a conversation about taxing the rich in front of very, very lobby people who lobby against it and puncture the fourth floor of excess and spectacle. Not really, to be honest. Everyone was kind of mocking the fact that you were wearing that dress as such a up as such a as such a um farcical event jeremy especially with the world being on fire right now that's what people were laughing at mostly but um i do think she has a point in terms of saying what she say here she said 
um, ultimately the haters hated and the people who were fought for were fought for. I do think that dress, as bad as it was, it did expose the fact that if you weren't a fan of hers, this was definitely a layup, right? For you to kind of dunk it in and hold onto the rim, shake that shit, maybe break the glass. And if you were a fan of her, this was an opportune moment to step in, even though you knew she fucked up, to basically cap for her and, you know, essentially let people know that you are team AOC for life, ride or die. This is basically a perfect moment for it. But it doesn't excuse the corny and lameness of that whole thing. She continues and says, honestly, our culture is deeply disdainful and unsupportive of women. This supposedly is now turned into an attack on women. People calling you out for wearing a dumb dress at a flipping self-serving, you know, excessive, opulent dinner that doesn't do anything for anybody um, isn't an attack on women. It's an attack on you specifically, right? Um, especially women of color and working class women, of course. She's got all the badges in it. Uh, I wonder if later on down in life, later on down in life, we're gonna end up turning all these things, like you know, things that you can't help, right? Being a woman, being somebody of color, growing up in a poor neighborhood, the things that you just like born into. You can't choose your parents or your circumstances you're born into, but people for whatever reason use those things as like achievement badges. Like it's like you go in the army and you get your little cross or you get your little star, whatever it may be called, and they put, pin them on their chest. So I wonder if further down the line, we will turn those things into like real achievements and turn them into stars that get pinned on your jacket in certain places. It's like, yeah, it's just get over yourself. The more, in, in, sorry, it continues here, it says, um, whether it's a lack of childcare support or especially uh, reserving pillory for the elected women and femme people, the more intersection one has the deeper the disdain i'm so used to doing the same exact thing that men do including popular male progressive executive officials and gain completely different response so all i can do is acknowledge that reality and make a decision as i am and as i grow through my life the intersectionality of it is bizarre because the intersectionality of it that she keeps mentioning is essentially what gave her the platform to do the thing that she's doing now the fact that she is you know from a low-income neighborhood the fact that she did grow up in a one person in a one parent household the fact that she did work in a bar all these things helped to get her where she wanted to get to and now suddenly because people are criticizing her she's now using it as something to beat herself with or whatever like uh, what it just seems so bizarre all of it seems so strange and again it's a shame because i legitimately i, I wouldn't say i kind of bought into the hype i thought oh shit this should actually be a legitimate kind of um person who could maybe make the left a little bit more palatable in the in the u.s maybe kind of get people interested to talk about very progressive ideas but presented in a very rational and clear way but she's essentially which is maybe might explain why the right were always kind of right on her and their reaction because they maybe saw a lot of themselves in her right and it's like you're phony you're acting you're trying to pretend you're one way but it's actually the other way um you know it continues it says um for example did you know many less officials regularly attend due to our responsibilities well why don't you don't attend in why don't make a stand and actually you know have morals or have a backbone or have ethics or whatever it may be called and don't go why do you have to go you don't have to go you get offered tickets of course but you don't have to take them but uh, anyway it continues it says that was one of my that was one of many yesterday did you know that if you live in NYC area, you can go to the Met, including the same costume exhibit that the wealthy saw last night for as little as a dollar as you'd like um, to check it out this weekend because the Met belongs to the people. No, it doesn't. Nothing about the Met Gala belonged to the people. The Met Museum may be later on down the line, but that spectacle, that every, the thing that everyone wants isn't the museum. No one gives a shit about the museum apart from the people that had their stuff, you know, shown in there. Most people saw the spectacle of the Met Gala, that red carpet, those interviews those flamboyant dresses and they wanted to be there right it was like a it was like everyone's personal princess story no one's thinking and dreaming of getting invited to the flipping met gala to go and look at stuff that they have no idea that they can understand they want to go and oogle and stare at and try and touch their you know hero celebrities the people they look up to that's what they actually want not the other thing but hey what do i know what do i know um let's move on did i have that on the screen the whole time i did have it on the screen the time. but yeah th that's a message in case you didn't miss it i hope you had it on the screen i think i did i'm not sure if i did but if i didn't you know please forgive i please forgive i next on list we're just gonna 
quick you know yeah because i mentioned the other day let's actually let me actually talk about some fits from the met gala that i actually did enjoy um let me get up on here on the screen so met gala 2021 fits that i actually did like um this is the emma chamberlain girl right youtuber she looks like she's about to go to sleep so maybe not her i thought kiki looked very nice and very elegant um i thought the dress suited her amazing the fact that it dropped out at the back right above her kind of crack area was stupid um the hair really matched it really well she was giving me she was giving me Tina Turner vibes, right? I don't know what cover it was on that LP where she's kind of like standing up and arms spread out, but that's kind of what it's giving me. But it is definitely very made, very American fashion, very Studio 54. Um, I loved everything about that. Let's get off the screen. It's going to take ages to load. I don't want it to load. Okay, let's not do loading. Let's get off the screen so I'll show you my favorite, my other favorites. Come on, please. If you don't mind, don't pause on me. If you don't mind, don't pause on me. Is it gonna do it? Is it gonna work or not? I don't know. I see. Oh, it's not working, is it? Shall I go back? Okay, it's working now. It's working now, baby. One second. Come on. There we go. Is it working now? I think it's back. There we go. It's back. Okay, cool. Let's just not do it. Let's just zoom from afar. So zoom from afar. I think that was Normani, right? Yeah. Or is that or some sort of gymnast? I don't know who that is. I don't care. Let's look at the ones I actually liked. I like this guy's suit, even though it was a bit weird looking. I like the fact that he came in with a suit that wasn't black. That was a nice little refresh. But again, no problem with the black suit because I saw Heron Preston and Tim Tom Ford rocking an exquisitely tailored Tom Ford suit, which looked amazing on both guys. Um, Tim Fish I thought looked pretty shit. Um, what did I like? Come on, move up and see what I liked. The Becks were okay. Um, you know, less said about the Dan, Dan Levy, the better, even though I love his Rick going fits in the Shits Creek. This girl, what's her name again? Something M. Hoff, isn't she? Uh, Kamala Harris's stepdaughter. She looked pretty decent here. I thought this is probably the best she looked vis facially, right? She looked like she's had a shower, um, had a bit of a wash, you know, washed her hair, got her nails did. Like, she looks good. Like, all in all in all like, let's not hate she looks good there scroll up the skater kid and tom brown he looks like a bit of a freak I'm not a fan of this i'm a fan of this dress and outfit i think looks completely superb i don't know who the young lady is but she looks really nice nice everyone looks nice 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 if you listen to this via audio i uh, please forgive me um of course billy eilish in this outfit was awesome I mean, a tribute to marilyn manson i'd assume it was but again what do i know boom 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 um that osaka tennis lady you know no wonder she gets harassed online because the outfit is terrible uh little nazesk you know last the, the least said about him the better just attention seeker and the outfit looks terrible um there were some good ones like i said yeah i, I love this this might have been one of my favorites I've, i'm pretty sure this is a rick owens dress right um what's his name again this is a is it toy c van he's like some he's a singer i'm pretty sure he's a singer or a pop act this is a fairly good outfit when it comes to, you know, um, going by the theme of American fashion. I'm pretty sure it's head to toe Rick. And of course, Rick being one of the more prominent American fashion designers out there. Obviously, maybe people will associate him more with Paris seeing as he's running Rick Owens out from there and Italy. But in terms of maybe, you know, quintessential American fashion and also kind of harkening back to a time and, you know, the you know, the sensuality of the outfit, this guy in this dress, it fits amazing. He's got the little leather belt there on the side of his arm, which I'm not really too sure what that deal is about, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of symbolism behind there. The jewelry is very tastefully done and it's just a small necklace that's still glistening there. Nothing crazy on the ears, nothing crazy on the hands. He's got a ring. What is that? Wedding finger, whatever. Just a normal thing on a band. But yeah, I love the entire look. Again, you'd have to be very slivet in terms of your figure to make that work as a dude. But it's just in terms of, you know, again, harkening back to it being an American fashion theme and him wearing an American fashion designer was awesome. It was very interesting that there was no one there wearing Mark Jacobs. I think some people have made that point on social, but considering he's one of maybe the he might be in the top 10 definitely in the top he's definitely in the top 10 he might be in the top five in terms of um the most important american fashion designers of all time and the fact that he was no one was wearing him well, is pretty weird especially considering people some people had on alexander wang and stuff still it's like what um we continue who else looked good um what's her name kai gerber she looked very nice i thought um in that black dress i think harkening back to um something to i forgot what it was 
we go, we go, we go. I thought this guy looked really good. He had like a jean jacket on with a white shirt and black kind of uh, platform boots with matching jeans as well. Obviously flared, but this is definitely a quintessential American attire, you know, white t-shirt, jeans, um, some boots. Again, it was a shame that we didn't see anybody in kind of a motorcycle um, influence kind of outfit, especially when you think of the Hells Angel, you think of Evil Knievel, um, you know, they got a strong legacy with all that kind of stuff. You'd think that would make a lot of sense, but that didn't happen. Not a lot of blue jeans. Um, what else? You know, not a lot of maybe khakis or new balance. I don't know, just kind of taking the theme and kind of playing around a bit, having a bit of fun. You didn't really see that from these people. Girl with a horse in front of her and shit. Um, we go on. I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. Oh, this is the Addison Ray girl. There's nothing, there's nothing more that represents kind of, you know, um, white privilege and you know the fact that some people just get lucky in life than as a ray because say what you want about that dixie d'amelio girl but you can tell there's something she's got an x factor right whether it's the way that she dances or how she talks and you know um to her fans or whatnot she's got something about her that you would you know be it would kind of it would kind of um help to explain to you why she has like you know more than a billion flipping followers on the tiktok or whatnot but when i see and hear anything with as ray especially when it comes to her music i'm like you're just garbage, isn't it? You, it's essentially like a rich people's make a wish, right? You've been able to kind of, without the terminal diseases, you've been able to basically wrangle your way into these weird circles of people and produce yourself a track just simply off the base that, off the back of that, you have a lot of disposable income. Do you know what I mean? It's insane. Or disposable income from your parents that you could spend. But, you know, I guess she's operating life and she's fine. Um, was it, what's her name again? Oh, I forgot her name. Tracy Turner is it Tracy is it Tracy something like that right um she looked incredible she was wearing uh Balenciaga couture which max which which matched matched completely with her bob which looked great um again don't know these people um this lady's an actress this is the Irina guy girl woman that Kanye was allegedly being linked to Madonna's daughter here doing the whole young people thing the girls love doing that and the young ones sticking their tongue out it's very kind of edgy but people are accusing her of having a couple of bumps before the Met Gala because she was aggressively wiping her nose and she was taking pictures on the red carpet. I don't believe that. Maybe there was a lot of air con on or she's got hay fever. It could be anything. <laughs> um, we continue. Obviously, the American football star, she had another kind of patriarchy-ish kind of message on her bag, which people seem to like. Fair play. I thought Maluma looked pretty terrible, but, you know, I just don't think you could dress. There's a lot of guys that are in it. Very attractive kind of male dudes who sing, dance, whatever, who just can't dance, who just can't, sorry, who just can't put themselves together in terms of outfit-wise. Frank Ocean was there debuting some new hair, um, supposedly a $1.2 million or $2 million necklace, and this new green toy thing that he speaks to when he's on the, you know, at an award show maybe it's one of those anxiety bears that we don't know about i don't really too sure but regardless it's good to see him back um we'll skip over these ones not that not that don't care don't care don't care but yeah basically i think i pointed out my points when it comes to the stuff that i liked and didn't like at the Met gala but you know again waste of time for most people most people are still struggling to find jobs, to put food on the table, to put their kids through school during this tough time and to see all these rich people prancing around while all the help, every bit, yeah, all the help. Look at this picture at the behind Sierra. Everyone that's not a celebrity has to wear a mask and they're only like, what, less than five feet away from each other or more than that or less than 10 for sure. But they will have to wear a face mask. But the actual people in there who are being celebrated or lauded for the ability to pick a flipping T-shirt um, and put it on and go outside, they're the ones that are having all the fun. It's pretty, pretty nuts. But, you know, what can you do? We live in a nutty world. We live in a nutty world. What else do we have here? What's going to talk about? We got that. We did this. We did that. I did quite a bit actually. I read the other night. Um, yeah, let's talk about this one. This is Lizzo and Zendaya. Now, this point I only wanted to make because of just ruminating about it the other day, thinking to myself, like, why can't we live in a world, right? We get a picture up here. Why can't we live in a world where looking like Lizzo is okay and should be promoted? And you should feel comfortable in your own skin, especially when it comes to how people deal with you in public. 
why why don't we live in a world where it's okay to look like this and it's and be somewhat celebrated and it's okay to look like this and be somewhat celebrated one image for the people that listen via the audio podcast is a picture of lizzo um in a very tight um short purplish um kind of shimmery dress thing and she's kind of showing us the back of her ass a little bit getting sexy with it and then the other picture is Zendaya attending a red uh, a red carpet event for June wearing um, a liar head to toe. They just took the entire look off from the runway and placed it on her body and it looks absolutely banging, right, in terms of how it fits and everything. But the reality of it, which we all know because we've got eyes, is that the reason why the dress looks amazing on Zendaya because she has a supermodel figure, right? Whatever sample size this dress is or whatever, however it was cut, it was specifically cut to make women that are Zendaya size look good. If you were to put that dress on Lizzo, for instance, it wouldn't look as good. But that doesn't matter, right? You, Lizzo should have her own lane where she exists, where she doesn't have to kind of conform to um, social beauty norms or whatever it may be called, right? Um, that's a good thing but the issue that I kind of have at the moment is that people fail or people refuse or people are unwilling to praise Zendaya because she's slim and looks great in clothes but they're willing to go overboard and kind of clap when a fat person knows how to write their name in a pen in, in pencil or something Jeremy's you know I mean? like it just doesn't really resonate or make sense with me in that regard I wish we could be a little bit more fair a little bit more understanding but the irony of it the entire situation of this as well when you think about it is that who really is to blame for these unfair beauty standards and um, lack of kind of, uh, what would you say, um, a lack of self-love and all this stuff? Who's to blame really for it? I would hazard a guess and say the main culprit is obviously fashion magazines and mostly women because these people that actually run these places. If you ever and if you ever doubted it, you need to kind of go incognito and sit down at a fashion shoot somewhere. There's no other place where you feel completely demeaned, you feel completely demoralized. Um, you just feel like you know you should change completely your career path and go for something else. It happens all the time. Um, so I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. I wish it could be a little bit more fair and parity in terms of how we talk about these women in pop culture or in culture in general. But unfortunately, we're at this weird precipice where because Lizzo feels like she's not represented enough and doesn't necessarily get a voice or people don't necessarily treat her the same because just because she happens to be big and she's wearing this doesn't mean people should kind of essentially not see any issue with her wearing whatever she's wearing. Do you know what I mean? That's, the I guess, the problem that she has. And we're at an impasse, so both sets of the teams are on either side of the room and no one wants to come in the middle and basically hash it out. They're just fine just occupying the ends of the room in that way, which is, you know, neither here or there, I guess. Neither here or there. Then we have another crazy image. This is courtesy of the internet. I'm not too sure who took it or where it was found. Again, don't come after me, North Korea, please. I have so much to do um, in my life. But this is a picture of allegedly um, Kim, Kim Jong-un, who has essentially lost a ton of weight and looks in absolutely fantastic shape. Again, he's not super in shape because we don't know because his suit is cut horrendously and we don't actually look know what he looks like underneath that shirt. But just looking at his face and his eyes, he has lost easily over 50 pounds, easily. And again, he was super fat last time, right? Way too fat than needed to be. Then I remember there was a rumor floating around that allegedly that he died. Remember the beginning of the pandemic? I think those rumors were fairly true or accurate. And what actually happened was that he was maybe severely ill with COVID, which is the rumor going around now. It hasn't been confirmed by North Korea, of course, because they don't want their dear leader or their supreme leader to be seen as weak or anything. Um, that essentially happened, but I do think it did happen. I, I do think yeah, I do think it did happen. He did probably get COVID. Um, obviously, they tr still dealt with it behind closed doors. And then during his time of recovery, um, which a lot of people say when you do get COVID, he ended up losing a ton of weight, maybe because of a lack of taste, the lack of smell, whatever. Something happens where people lose their appetite and they tend to drop loads of weight. Just look at Joe Rogan. He got COVID recently and he looks the slimmest I've ever seen him look in recent times. But again, this is clear indication that I don't know, but you know, again, I'm not, uh, I don't know what women think of him, but I would imagine this is a clear indication, especially when it comes to dudes, you're far better off trying to lose some weight, maybe at least 20 pounds or whatever you weigh, especially if you're overweight, than you are to do anything else in your life. Oh, losing just a few pounds is something um, way more transformative for a guy in terms of his ability to attract women than it is for any uh, anything else you, you do. 
And again, it's the hardest thing to do, to try and lose 20 pounds in like a few months or maybe a year. It's very difficult. You have to kind of change all your old crappy habits, maybe do away with the shitty food, blah, 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 blah. But essentially, the end goal is for you to have this kind of glow up where you essentially look 10 times better than you did when you were fat. You look like a completely new man. Like Kim Jong-un never had a chin. And even now, just because he's got, he lost a ton of weight, you can see some semblance of a chin. Now, does this mean... Does, or am I mistaking this for filler? I don't know. But regardless, he's looking healthy. He's looking fit and fine. He's looking like he's all limbered up. He's not having to wear one of those um, carpal tunnel wristband things on his arm because he's been pressing the, the nuclear go button too much. But he doesn't know that his advisor has kind of pulled the plugs out from behind it. But regardless, um, Kim Jong-un is looking absolutely trim these days. He definitely went on that peanut and he course or something, innit? He was not fucking around. Um, what else? I think that might be it, you know. Yeah, I think I've actually mentioned everything. I think I might leave it there for now. What the, what time do I have I been operating at? Yeah, an hour. Yeah, so it's been an hour anyway. So let's leave it for now. Thanks so much for tuning in at the Axion Zinger Show, episode number 498, I think, if I'm not mistaken. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, please make sure you hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. I'd really appreciate it. And of course, leave me a five-star review on your Apple Podcast app. It only takes five minutes. Leave me a review, help the show to spread and to get further up. And of course, if you want to support the Patreon, the link is in the description. Click on it, get involved. New Patreon episode coming end of the week. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be well.